damn, Dave, we made that joke and we weren't even live. Oh, oh we can do that again. When are we supposed to officially start? Five o'clock? We do. We do. Also known as seven o'clock for people in the Midwest. Hey, you yeah. know what? Can I do some thank yous real quick? You, you should do that. I can. Go for it. Build it. All right. Take cool. it. You go ahead. So first of all, I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank our MCs, Joff, Kent, Jordan, CJ, Brian, BB King, and John Strand. Thanks for the testers to the BHIS testers for creating some of the awesome labs. Special shout out to Rick Wisser for the swag bag lab. Totally cool. Brad and Derek and went over and above to help. And behind the scenes, Laura, who handles our logistics, amazing job. She's also the creator of this t-shirt, so very cool. Laura, Heather, Jennifer, and Erica for handling the swag bags and getting them out. Marita and Jen for being the bank. Jason, Deb, and Ryan for their tire, tireless efforts on Discord. Is that a time yet? <laughs> and Shelby, who kind of helped us with the website earlier this year. My sidekick and trusted partner. The Ranger, Justin, and the whole staff. Good job, it takes a village of crazy to accomplish like this together. I was accidentally in some of the other class channels, and I was like reading questions from other classes and answering those questions in my class. And it was horrible. <laughs> Are we going to cover Sigma in this class? I'm like, okay, so Sigma is something that we would generally cover in the purple team in class, not something we would cover here. And it was a question in like your class. So <laughs> questions about Linux forensics and inodes. It's like, okay, that's a deep question. You should probably give that to Al Pomerantz. So it's it an awesome day. Holy crap, there's a lot of people here for the first night of the con. They're all here to see you. No, that's well, you definitely look, you not look, the case. You look good. You look fit. You look good, man. I saw you biking the other day. You look at the, oh my God, that yeah. look. Dang. Yeah. It, it, it's weird to introduce Dave Kennedy because he's so incredibly awkward to introduce because everybody knows him. And one of the things I'd like to bring out is why do we all know Dave Kennedy? And I think the reason why we all know Dave Kennedy, other than his amazing interviews on like Fox News and CNN and all those things, is what he's given to the community. Tremendous toolkits, tremendous research, constant presentations. Um, another one of the great security pen testing firms, Dave, myself, and a number of other owners of pen testing firms, a uh, long list of people that we, that we know and we love and we trust. There are very few really good pen testing firms out there. And uh, Trusted Sec is without question one of the best. There are even fewer really good MSSPs out there. And Binary is without question one of the best. And uh, I, I, I often think about how uh, happy I am that whenever it comes to the news, when it comes to hacking, when it comes to the security community, Dave Kennedy is without question the ambassador for our community to the rest of the world. So it's an absolute honor to introduce Dave to present again at Wild West Hacking Fest, this time not dressed up as a cockroach. So I just want to kick it off and say, Dave, thank you so much for coming. And you, sir have the virtual stage. Awesome. Thank you, John, so much. And I think I'm blushing here. If you can see my, uh, my, my, my face is getting a little red. I appreciate all the kind words. And, uh, you know, honestly, uh, John, what you've done for the community, what your team does for the community for, for Wild West Hacking Fest, I, I really wish we could have all been there in person. It, it is absolutely one of my favorite conferences. And, uh, you know, this, this whole COVID thing has been, been interesting for me. I don't think without it, I would have slowed down at all. I was continuously traveling all the time. And, you know, always wanted to stop traveling, but COVID really forced me to stop traveling. And, uh, you know, after this whole thing, I, I told my family and everybody else that, that I'm not going to be going back to to speaking quite frequently unless it's going to be, you know, virtual. I'm not going to be doing conferences. And, uh, you know, I told Aaron, my wife, I said, you know, the, one of the only conferences that I will go to is, is Wild West Hacking Fest because I just love the community there. I love what you've been able to build, John, and your team. Um, you know, same thing over all the folks at BH, uh, BHIS. I mean, just amazing group of folks that you can trust and, and, and stay with. And we love 
working with you folks and, and doing everything we do. So thank you again for, for having me uh, here today. I really wish I could be in person to, to say hi to everybody. And, uh, and Deadwood, I saw it was snowing there already, which is insane. So I'm, I'm actually kind of glad I'm not there, to be perfectly honest, because I could still use my pool. But, uh, but I, I would always be there in, in two seconds to, to come out and uh, to, to help out in every way, shape, or form. My name's Dave. I really appreciate you coming to, to my talk today. This is a, this is a talk that, that's really important to me because when you look at the, the evolution um, of, of where we've come, and, and this is where we've come from my time, uh, you know, there, there was a lot happening in the security scene well before me well before John, well before everybody else that we know it, but, but giving you perspective of when I first got into this industry and to where it's at today, we, we've come so, so far, so many leaps and bounds. And there's a lot to, 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 to argue, there's a lot to debate, there's a lot to say that we don't do well, but when it comes to what it was when I first got into this industry, you know, 20, 25 years ago or longer than that, you know, it, it's changed substantially. And, and this talk is really gonna be about where we came from to where we are today and why we need to keep moving in this direction. And, and it's a good direction and it's a great direction. It's the right direction. And if you look at the world, nothing is perfect. I think we know that right now, right? Uh, we never thought that a global pandemic uh, would hit all of us and we'd all be sitting at home celebrating and, and, and talking to each other through Discord. If you want a good tutorial on Discord, Jason's the one to, to ask for that. But we're all here remotely talking to one another you know, sharing our experiences and, and knowing that we don't have a perfect world. And again, security is far from perfect, but we've come a long, 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 long ways. I won't go into a full spiel. I, I, John did a great job with it, but I really appreciate being part of this industry, and, you know, helping it, uh, trying to make it grow, trying to help customers and organizations. And my whole goal has always been to, to make the world a better place. It's been a mission since I was a kid. You know, I just wanted to mention that um, kind of sucked this year because uh, COVID had hit at a very inopportune time. Uh, I, I came from a, a very lower class um, upbringing. You know, uh, the, the net median income for, for where I was grow, uh, growing up at was $30,000, which was below the national average of 50000 And I came from a, 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 a city called Bedford, which was an inner city school uh, in Cleveland. And it was always my dream to, to help that school out in some way, shape, or form, uh, to, to help kids that were going through that, because I got really lucky because my dad, as part of his job, he completely changed from being uh, in, in sales, being a, a spray paint uh, a sales or, uh, person to, to converting his entire career to being a systems administrator. My dad was always somebody that I, I looked up on, uh, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, as, as you know, many dads. And you know, I had great, great parents. I can't, you know, I'm very fortunate to have amazing parents. But one of the things that, that we didn't have at Bedford was, was technology. And I really look at technology as being the, the major divider for what can be constituted as success in somebody's career versus not having access to technology and, and being stricken into poverty. And so this last year, I made a substantial donation to Bedford High School. I've been on the technology board of, of Bedford High School for a number of years, helping guide their technology programs, donated computers, things to that effect. But this year we actually um, donated a, uh, I donated a substantial amount to create a, a, um, a esports gaming facility, state of the art uh, for, for Bedford High School which kids now had uh, uh, opportunities we paired with the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers esports e teams, as well as um, local and national colleges. And we created 11 scholarship opportunities uh, for kids that year. So, you know, my whole thing has always been trying to give back to people, give back to folks that don't have it. If you look at what uh, Chris Sanders is doing with the Rural Tech Fund, you know, you can make a big difference when it comes to, to technology and having technology impact the rest of the world. And you know that's really what you know we're all here to do, and to help help the world become a safer place when it comes to, to cybersecurity. So yeah, I just appreciate being part of it. Everybody that's helped me out um, throughout the course of the years, you know, obviously DerbyCon, all those different areas were, were all key things to me. Just most recently, I bought a DeLorean. I'm actually really bummed uh, that I couldn't do this presentation in the DeLorean. I was hoping that it would be here by now. I'm actually getting it on Monday. My my 19 it's a 1982. DMC DeLorean manual, 100% the exact same replica of, 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 of what they use for Back to the Future. And I'll be slowly converting it to the, the Back to the Future machine over some time. So, you know, stay tuned for that. Um, but really excited to, to, to be driving that as my, set, my, my only, I've never had a second car before. So this is like my second car. And it's uh, one of those ones where I can't wait to work on it and figure out cars more and do, do certain things. I just want to uh, thank Jason Blanchard uh, for, for helping out with all of this. He's the mastermind behind a lot of all of this that you see here. I've been taking secret screenshots of him throughout, you know, the past, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes 
And I've also incorporated it into all my slides um, as we go through this presentation. So Jason, I love you. And I only do this because I love you so much. Anyways, so before we begin uh, and before we kick everything off here, this is a, a friendly debate and discussion because when you talk about um, exploits, techniques, and tooling, they're, they're very different things. Exploits being things that can compromise the integrity of a, of a security system or it, that um, its intended purpose of protecting against. Techniques are, are things that are unintended consequences or techniques that an adversary may use to, to compromise or do post-exploitation scenarios. And tools are, are more weaponization of techniques or things that can be used for command and control or other purposes um, in order to help accomplish certain tasks when it comes to exploitation or post-exploitation scenarios. So we're going to be talking a little about that and a little bit of the history behind all that. But, but know that, that my views, you know, obviously I come very much from a, a, a offensive mindset and seeing what offensive capabilities can do to an organization when it comes to being able to bolster their security. And there's a lot of people that are in, in different perspectives and different viewpoints, and th that's not wrong. There's no wrong answer here. Um, this is really to talk about where we've come from, where we are now, and where we're heading to, and why we need to continue the way that we're doing things to, to continue to get better with, with security in, in general. But I want to start off with, with an introduction to, to when I first got into security. And I remember um, I was in the Marine Corps on the intelligence side, and uh, I, had, I had been bugging my, my uh, gunny uh, to say, hey, gunny, you know, can, can I go to DEF CON? Can I go to DEF CON? Can I go to DEF CON? I've always wanted to go to DEF CON. And, um, and he's like, fine, finally, I annoyed him enough. And uh, he let me go to DEF CON. I think it was DEF CON 9, and it was at Alexis Park. And I remember going there. And what was interesting then was it was, it was an extremely small industry at that point in time. I mean, when I say small, I mean, you know, you had maybe a thousand people, you know, uh, coming to that, less than that, probably. So a smaller sized conference, you know, that, that focused on this new and upcoming industry security. And this was a very unique time because things were a lot easier. And when I say easier, things hadn't been discovered yet. And, and things still haven't been discovered today. But there was a, a lot of exploring happening. You know, you had the calls of the dead cows releasing, releasing back Orifice on stage. And, you know, you had new exploits being run. And it was, it was all about showing your skill level. And that was kind of the commodity piece that, that happened back then. And, and when you look at, at Millworm, Millworm was a, a credibility piece. I remember when I first got my first exploit on Millworm, I think it was, a, uh, it was an exploit for Spiceworks. I had found a zero day in Spiceworks and um, they silently had patched it and all sort of stuff. But anyways, I, I got my first exploit up on, on Millworm and I was super excited about it. And then from there, I had an Internet Explorer one or a few other ones that came out and then I wrote some white papers. But getting your, your name on Millworm at that time was, was like, the most prestigious like thing I was you know a stroke and stroke was the guy that that wrote uh, ran Miller at the time and that was like one of the most things like a stroke and accept my exploits you know he's gonna have any feedback those types of things and and you know the the exploit piece of it was a big deal because you know we were exploring things that hadn't been discovered before finding things that hadn't been discovered before new techniques were coming out you know Microsoft introduced um, data execution prevention I remember a frac article on, on how to get around data execution prevention to kind of piece it together and figure things out you know as an industry we were we were figuring out what we were doing and, and the things were, were, were really the wild west you know we were releasing exploits there was no responsible disclosure if it was a zero day it was a zero day you know if it was an exploit it was an exploit everybody's security was so bad at that point anyway that it really didn't matter and so it was it was one of those things where we really focused on, on just pumping out what we could to show the world that these things exist and, and hoping that somebody would listen to us. And, and the industry started changing into a, a, an actual industry, which, which we'll talk about here in just a few minutes, but it was all about you know, your credibility and, and building up your name and, and being an awesome hacker and learning and exploring and figuring new things out and, and collaborating with other people. I remember being in the remote exploits group for, for a long time. And that was before it became offensive security. And, you know, I was part of the, the backtrack development team, um, which eventually became Kali Linux. And, you know, there's WAPIX and IWAX. And I worked with Mutz and those folks. And, you know, early on, it was, it was us just sitting in IRC chat rooms and, and homing in on things and figuring things out and, you know, rewriting and patching and writing our own code for, for kernel drivers and, you know, getting monitor mode to work on a car that had never, never worked before. So, you know, again, it was, it was an exploratory, very immature industry and, and we're still a very immature industry in the context of how other industries have been been made but it was all about you know publishing your own stuff and releasing your own things and showing what you could do and i remember uh it was funny uh i found a, a uac bypass in in i think it was like windows vista at the time and uh hd was hd Moore was a good friend of mine and 
I remember that that I submitted um, a, a, a request to HD for the the new exploit to get in there. It was a, a local privilege escalation, so you could bypass UAC at the same time. It, it was a run space, you know, post exploitation slash, you know, actually there were there weren't even post exploitation modules there at that point in time uh, in Metasploit, but it was a local privilege escalation for for UAC. And I remember I sent it to HD, and I was sweating it the whole time. And HD sends it back, and he said, you know, I, I give him my code. I I spent probably an extra two days on it, cleaning it up and making sure that the code was absolutely perfect. And I remember HD sent it back to me. He's like, and it was like an hour later, he sends it back to me. And he says, hey, man, you know, uh, the code looks great. I only made a couple minor changes. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be publishing it, you know, next ne or tomorrow or today inside of Metasploit. Nice job. And I'm like, awesome. I felt really good about myself. I had spent, you know, you know, weeks on this and working on the research and everything else. And uh, I remember looking at the code after HD had, had uh, taken a look at it. And I think there was like, two variable names that were the same and everything else was completely rewritten because my, my Ruby code was absolutely horrible. And that was the, that was like the, the fun of, of everything that happened, right? And and during that period of time, the 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 offensive mindset was more of like a magician. You know, we were more of like these 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 secret, you know, cloak and dagger, you know, going in and, and finding these techniques. And and a lot of companies didn't understand what we were doing. And we were really in the shadows for things, right? You know, we kept a lot of the techniques away, the exploits, you know, especially if it was a zero day. You know, we'd publish some of them for certain, you know, certain uh, street credibility pieces and you'd see zero days get published. But largely, the, the way that we hacked was largely in the shadows. And there were tools out there like Metasploit and, 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 and Map and other tools out there that were, that were getting um, released and, 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 and pushed out. But largely, the, the way that we hacked into systems and the way that we moved to other systems and the way that we kind of operated by wasn't necessarily a close secret, but we didn't work with Blue very heavily with that. In fact, you know, our, our main goal, if you look at, at 10 years ago to today or 15 years ago to today, was we would go into an organization, we'd compromise them with whatever exploit we could, whatever hack we could, whether it was null sessions or SQL injection or a buffer overflow or, you know, weak passwords, whatever it ends up being. But we never focused on what our, or what our tradecraft was after the fact that things happened. You know, once, once an actual attack occurred, those post-exploitation scenarios around initial access, you know, uh, privilege escalation, lateral movements, all those different things that were happening out there. And, and really, that was our, our, our secret sauce as, 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 as adversaries or attackers. And, and the, the, the adversary space around China, Russia, the United States with the equation group operated very similarly. You know, they had their own set of, of very critical exploits that they would use, i.e., you know, um, Eternal Blue and everything else that happened out there with, with the, the, um, the specific Shadow Brokers leak. And, but they had their own subset of tooling that they worked very heavily on that was their secret sauce that would work after the fact. What happens when we actually use Eternal Blue on a system and then what happens when we start to go out to the actual assets that we need in order to get, gather our intelligence or the information that we're looking for uh, for a specific operation? And so everything was, was really in the shadows. And the security industry experienced a, a pretty dark time during those periods of time because companies were just, just getting owned left and right. I mean, literally just getting owned left and right. We saw LawSec, you know, hack Sony 10 different times. We saw all these different things happening all, all over the place. Uh, massive credit card breaches, you know, and, and all these things were happening all at the same time because we were focusing solely on, on what the initial access or the entry point was into organizations and not focusing on what the actual techniques were that adversaries or attackers were focusing on. And it's a big difference. When you look at vulnerability management as an example, vulnerability management is not a perfect program. It will never be a perfect program. Most organizations, the word CMDB is is a bad word. They, you know, you're not allowed to use that word in our own organization. Um, asset management and understanding, you know, configuration management on those systems and baselining, which is extremely difficult to do. Vulnerability management is is by far the hardest program in an information security program. Period. Because you got to interface with everybody, every piece of technology, every new piece of technology, every old piece of technology, and you got to figure out a way to lock it down. And so with vulnerability management, you know, our assumptions were we were going to have this massive, heavily fortified moat of, uh, you know, this, this perimeter where, you know, our firewalls were going to protect everything. But once, you know, we have some sort of flaw in our brick or the doors are open or the windows are open or somebody lets somebody in, now all of a sudden we have this weak infrastructure behind us. And now we have, you know, BYOD in the cloud and everything else and all these interconnected systems. Our programs were never designed to handle that type of, of, of 
shift in technological advancement. And the security industry didn't move as fast as we should have with that. And so now you have you know, programs that are designed to try to be a castle, but it's literally you know, a wood shed and, and, and you, know, you literally hit it with an ax and it completely crumbles um, in, in each and every way. And now we have no way of defending that wood shed and everything else that's behind it. And so the, the industry was, was in the shadows. We focused on the wrong things. And I want to quote uh, John Strand recently on this. And what's interesting is if you Google John Strand, that's what you find. So, John, I don't know if you have a side gig uh, modeling, but looking pretty good uh, working out, man. But uh, John said, um, Blue, you do not want us to go back into the shadows. And, 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 and I think what John was hitting on there, and, and I fully agree with, is that, you know, if, if, if you want us to hide our techniques and you want us to hide our tooling, you will not have the right tooling and you will not have the right techniques to withstand adversaries. And, and that holds 100% true to today. If we, if we start to look at hiding our tools, uh, minimizing our tools, not showing our tools, not publishing our tools, not releasing our research, we will go back substantially 10 years ago and have the same problems that we face today. Security will not be taken seriously. We're not as serious. And there will be a lot of major reper repercussions as we start to go into a uh, type of, 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 of um, state where, where we're, we're going back to security through obscurity. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. And so what happened you know, in, in the shadows is, is Dan Kaminsky. And, and Kaminsky was, was really cool at the time. I, I remember going through all of this. And, and Dan got, and he got nailed hard. He got hacked a few times uh, by, by a few different hacking groups. And, you know, um, but Dan uh, really um, took something that was really interesting. And you know, he found the major DNS flaw that that could have critically essentially impacted the entire internet and shut the entire internet down. It was one of the first ones that that literally really could have shut down the internet. And you know, we heard uh, the Schmoo group and you know those folks uh, testify in front of con Congress, and and not not just Schmoo group, but you know all those folks. And um, you know, when it came to uh, uh, Dan, Dan really tried to focus on responsible disclosure. And responsible disclosure was, was a relatively new concept uh, for the industry because we were used to just publishing our tools and releasing all of our stuff and then saying, hey, good luck. You know, we'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. You know, have a good time with it. And all, by the way, I'm the most amazing hacker because I found the zero day and then I published it, right? But with responsible disclosure, we learned, hey, if organizations take us seriously and we give them a time window, you look at what's happening with zero day initiatives and a lot of others, you know, organizations can actually protect um, themselves, get the fixes out, and start to really benefit uh, from those and not put our customers at risk. And so all of those things started to happen in a way that, that really protected organizations. Okay. Um, and so um, when that all occurred, Dan, Dan really made a big change in how we did things as an industry. And that really continued to focus down the road of everything else we saw past then. And so, you know, with, with responsible disclosure, exploits and things that impacted organizations or code or software that were deployed, we came through a, a relatively standardized process of giving people certain amounts of time and day to actually go and release those, those specific um, exploits themselves. And now it's not a perfect system. We see exploits that are released. But what's interesting is uh, you look at what happened with the most recent uh, Citrix NetScaler piece. You know, with that specific one, you know, what was interesting about that I didn't understand was the, the reaction from the security industry. And, and so this the Citrix Netscaler vulnerability had been out for, for several, I mean, it was at that point it was months. And yes, there were still vulnerable systems out there, but then there was a researching group that actually published the proof of concept and they got you know literally attacked for specifically doing that. Now, I understand that there's a, a philosophical debate of trying to get everybody as much time as possible to protect against it, but there had already been a substantial amount of time since the uh, patch had come out before the exploit was actually released before that actually occurred. We saw the most recent one with the Microsoft privilege escalation uh, issue with, with, with Active Directory. You can privilege escal escalate from a domain user to a domain admin. That one was, you know, quickly went, for, went from a patch to a proof of concept. Um, so all those things became uh, really, really important, you know, again, to, to get those out as quick as possible to actually go and test them. And one thing that actually happened is that uh, exploits just, just got harder. You know, when you look at, at what happened a few years ago to today, you know, all the protection mechanisms 
that we have in, t- uh, in today's operating systems completely change as well. I remember going through, this is, this is one of my first exploits that I wrote that got around um, data execution prevention. And um, I remember Mutz uh, from Offsec had posted this specific one. He found a zero day in a, a really crummy mail program called SL Mail. And I decided to take that exploit and then convert it over to something that bypassed data execution prevention. At that time, there wasn't, you know, it wasn't known as return-oriented programming or ROP gadgets or, 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 you know, doing any of those types of exploits, even though it was at that time. Uh, there was like a FRAC article, I think written by Egypt or somebody, that, that kind of explained, you know, how to get around that, but it wasn't really, there wasn't really a lot of exploits that, that went into it. So I spent a lot of time, you know, learning exploit mitigation, exploit research, zero-day research, and, you know, eventually ended up writing my own first bypass for, for data execution prevention. And, you know, again, none of the tooling was there at that time. So this, this exploit took me like two weeks, you know, to figure out the right instruction sets um, in specific DLLs. Like I know there was a couple of instruction returns in uh, NTDLL, a couple in, in Shell32. And uh, eventually I was able to get around data execution prevention. But the research time that got into exploits was harder. And that was all due to responsible disclosure. You look at what happened with responsible disclosure. You know, you had you had companies that were willing to work with exploit researchers to actually go and fix specific issues and also issue bounties and awards. Thank you, Katie, for a lot of those to, to get those incorporated into into the into the life cycle for actually addressing. And so you look at what happened with Microsoft, completely different today than they were 10 years ago and how they dealt with researchers. I had a very similar experience with PowerShell. I gave the very first ever PowerShell security talk. It was at DEF CON with one of my good friends, uh, Josh Kelly. And uh, I remember I was working at uh, Diebel at the time. And uh, Josh uh, 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 and uh, myself were sitting in this, this meeting from a Microsoft rep for, for Diebel. And uh, they came in and said, hey, you know, I just give you guys what's on our roadmap and everything. There's this um, new, new scripting language that we're looking at incorporating. It's going to make things so much easier to in- in- incorporate you know, all of these things into your environment and to do maintenance and management and all these things. It's called PowerShell. I'm like, well, that's cool. I haven't heard about it. What, what is this? And they're like, well, it's not going to be mandatory in any of our operating systems yet, but we're, we're you know, there's, there's discussion that this will eventually be in here. But we're thinking about adding it as an add-on feature for uh, Windows Vista uh, and Server 2003, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was like, oh, cool, this sounds interesting. And so uh, I remember doing some research with, with PowerShell at the time in its really early stages. And I remember we did a, our first DEF CON talk, and I think it was at DEF CON 12 or DEF CON 13, and uh, it was called PowerShell OMFG. And that's where we figured out, you know, hey, we can get around execution restriction policies with things like encoded command. We can do reverse shells. I remember I wrote the, a, a, a module with PowerShell that would dump the SAM database called PowerDump. I thought that was kind of funny at the time, very much a child. And so I started working on, on different things around PowerShell research and exploitation. And what was interesting about that was, you know, if, talking to, to Jeff Snover, the, the father of PowerShell, and with Lee Holmes, you know, PowerShell was at its very infancy stages and a lot of security had not been built into it. And that talk really actually sparked the security foundation of what is built into PowerShell today. Jeff Snover, you know, said, you know, I consider Dave to be the, Power, the father of PowerShell security, which is an amazing, humbling thing to hear. But, but what that did, though, the research, what we were able to use and what we were able to talk to Microsoft through, you know, eventually came into all the hard work that came into constrained language mode, everything that you see within PowerShell version six and above all the integration into um, the anti-malware, anti-malware scan interface, which again, is not perfect, but you know, there, there, are, there are definitely advances in a lot of things that occurred because of the research that goes into this field and trying to make companies better. And that research has really made it big for, for exploits and for new things that are being incorporated from a technology perspective, i.e. PowerShell, .NET and C Sharp. You know, all the things that we're seeing as attack surfaces on the systems are things that we can now look at and start to protect against when it comes to you know, our, 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 our environments. And so what we saw was security got better. And, and security you know, became something that, you know, and this isn't 100% uh, for, for every organization, but hang on a second, my dogs are going insane. Give me, give me just two seconds here really quick. I'm just gonna go go melody. All right, I'm back. Sorry, sorry about that. And so um, security got, got substantially better when it came to a lot of different organizations. 
you had organizations that that um, you know actually started investing in security. You had organizations that started largely focusing on building security into their early stages versus latter stages. And again, this isn't 100% um, on, on par to every company, but things change quite a bit and things are changing quite a bit to, uh, today. Now, one thing I want to focus on is that you know our old way of thinking when it came to looking at things from an exploitation perspective where attackers were actually going in and, and finding initial entry points, our thought patterns also changed as well. And we started looking at, at things like, hey, when an attacker compromises our infrastructure, regardless of irrespective of the vulnerability, what happens afterwards? What happens after they get initial access to our systems? And so you saw things like the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. And I remember talking about this several years ago before the cyber kill chain came out. And I, I know we got a drink for that. I got, I got water here. I'm trying to be healthy. And, and with, with the, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain, you know, what happened was, is it visualized what happens after an attack occurs. And, you know, the, the focus was less on the initial entry port and the, or the exploit and more so on, hey, when they get access to our systems, they're typically going to try to grab hashes. They're going to try to do privilege escalation. They're going to try to extract clear text passwords out of memory. They're going to try to do post-exploitation scenarios and move laterally across systems. Um, and then from there, they're going to try to get access to other systems and, and, and get access to the data that they need access to. And so it visualized things in a way um, that allowed us to look at things in a different light and saying, well, our security program isn't all about our defenses when it comes to protection. It's also about, can we stop an attacker in its earlier stages? And so we saw a bit of an evolution around that with things like MITRE ATT&CK. And MITRE ATT&CK is a great you know, uh, uh, framework around being able to look at all the different phases of an attack and breaking down individual adversaries and mapping those techniques and doing all the things that we talk about. Now, we'll talk about some of the downfalls here, but really we got better you know, down the road because of a lot of things that we've implemented today. But the, the, you know, testing has never really changed when it comes to how we actually go after systems. Like when you look at, at 10 years ago to today, the way that we hack 10 years ago to the way that we hack today is, is still very similar uh, in, in, in ways that the tools have gotten better, the techniques have gotten better, but our ultimate goal is to get access to initial system and to spread out and to move to other systems like wildfire. So we really haven't looked at it from a different perspective, but the way that we actually focus on remediating those issues has changed. So let's take a look at, at what we focus on now when we do a penetration test or a red team engagement, or we're looking at how we build defenses in an organization. It's less so on the initial exploit factors. Now, those are risks, and we have to look at those risks. We have to address those risks from a, a, a patching perspective. But then we also have the latter stages of things where we're looking at, hey, how do we stop privilege escalation? How do we stop lateral movement? How do we architect our, our network infrastructure to protect against it? How do we secure our cloud infrastructure uh, to protect all of those different things? And all of those components made out a big deal around the evolution of how we actually build our defenses. And so that's really where, as an industry, we're heading towards, and that's where we need to continue to head towards, but we can't do that without having the right tools to, and the appropriate ways of validating that within our environment. I'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. Some of the shifts in attack surface occurred, and, and uh, Jason, I told you I threw you throughout all these slides. I got a few more with you as well. But you know, a, a shift in attack surfaces um, has also happened. You look at, at you know, um, executables as being the, the predominant method, then PowerShell, now living off the land and other, other methods research around you know different types of techniques and tooling you know we, we 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 shift and move as as our defenses get better but as as largely as an industry really haven't changed much uh, for for several years on how we actually attack organizations now here's an example um of of the defender mindset and what i want to get out of this and, and hopefully what you get out of this this entire presentation is that when when we look at at defense we typically look at defense in, in, a, in a binary format. Do we have coverage or not? It's, it's a one or a zero. So, so in defense, and I'm not saying this is, this is consistent across the board, but most defenders will look at, at coverage. They don't look at effectiveness. So when we look at coverage around, do we have a protection against this specific attack? The answer would be, yes, we have coverage. But we don't know how effective our coverage is because we're typically not looking at our effectiveness. We're looking at whether or not we have coverage. And so the main crux of issues that we have today in security, and this is why we, we need to continuously evolve and get better, 
is that coverage does not equal effectiveness. And coverage does not equal how well you are protected against a specific type of attack. And that's some of the big downfalls of things like MITRE attack. It's not MITRE's fault. It's how we implement MITRE in our organization. If you're trying to build a signature database of command line arguments and not focusing on what that actual attack is doing, you have a major problem because you might have some coverage in that individual area, but your effectiveness isn't going to be there. A great example is look at this. So in, in Windows Defender, you have you know Registry R32, which is going to go out to the internet um, and, and download um, a scriptable object um, directly from the internet and then execute it, right? Now, Microsoft you know, decided that, hey, any type of, of going out and reaching out to the internet with Registry 32 is going to be bad from a Windows Defender perspective. Now, why they didn't remove it from the actual um, binary itself in its application, I don't know, but you know, instead they decided to write a, a specific signature. So again, from a Windows Defender perspective, as a control, it has a, a coverage of this specific attack, but is it effective? The truth of the matter is no, it's not, because we can easily you know, manipulate this in some way, shape or form uh, to get around their detection and it becomes less effective and you have less coverage over that specific areas because we can just modify this attack. So this attack, and I'll explain here in just a second what I'm talking about, what we're using here is we're just gonna use bits admin instead. And we're gonna use bits admin to go out to our website, which isn't being blocked by Windows Defender. And then we're going to call Registry 32 with that test document that, we, that contains our scriptlet object which contains our malicious code, which in this case is just doing calc. And then we're going to call a script, the scripted object DLL to interpret our, our code. And then we're gonna pop our, our remote code execution component. Now, so we might have coverage here, but it's not effective. Because as an attacker, if I manipulate or change my attack in some way, shape or form, if it's the same type of technique, it should still be effective. And what I mean by that is, if you look at something like RegSVR32, as an example, why not baseline your environment for when RegSVR32 is being executed in the first place? And, and, and looking for those, those baseline behaviors and protecting against that or detecting against that in some way, shape, or form. It, it's, it's a very different way of looking at things. And I guarantee you, if you look at RegSVR32, which is one of the most commonly abused executables you know, for, for ransomware, you, you can probably baseline your environment and say, hey, we probably don't have any systems at all in our environment that ever call that in the first place. Or if we do, we put exceptions in place for those specific ones. We monitor for baselines for those. So our effectiveness goes up because we're looking for any time Registry 32 is created in the first place, process creation, part of minor attack. Again, it's, it's a way of looking at things differently than what we do. And we'll talk about OSTs and tooling here in just a second. So again, we have, we have coverage. So it's a binary, one or zero. So one, we have coverage, but our effectiveness is not very good, right? Here's another example using uh, Magic Unicorn. And this is an example of, of relying off of the anti malware scan interface, which is not a good effective method. There's so many different ways of getting around EMSI. Uh, you can patch it, you can remove it, you can shut it down, you can tell it not to scan. There's, there's a thousand different techniques to get around EMSI. It is not a effective security control for detection in your environment. But in this case, we're gonna use my tool called Magic Unicorn. We're gonna create some, some PowerShell code and we're gonna have it get detected by the anti malware scan interface really quick. Now, again, in this specific case, we have a we have coverage, you know, of the specific we have we have coverage of the specific one, but the effectiveness of this is probably pretty low. So we're going to copy this over our code, and we're going to copy it over to the interpreter over on my Windows 10 machine. And in here, once we go, we're going to um, get a Metasploit uh, council going to catch our reverse shell. Um, in this specific case here, we're going to play it, and we get the malicious code has been blocked by your antivirus product. So we're going to sit there and try to figure out what's wrong and what's actually getting um, hit. Now, I usually know where, where it's going to be being hit because it's the same common area each time. What we're going to do is we're just going to rewrite a specific... No, notice here, when we cut that out, we hit play. It, it automatically... Let me pause this really quick. It automatically... I took out the invoke expression and I hit play again and notice that it didn't get detected. Now, when you're looking at AMSI, I'm not going to go into all this. You can look at my previous talks with Wild West Hacking Fest to explain AMSI. But typically with AMSI, there's AMSI scans during an AMSI scan buffer. So in this specific case, when AMSI.dll gets injected into my process space and gets that hook put into place to actually scan my code, if I remove that specific component there and I scan it, we know that, that this last specific statement 
is is getting picked up by by the AMSI engine that's ultimately going to be scanned by the AMSI provider, which is going to be Windows Defender. But in this specific case, we know that's going to be picked up, so we have to figure out a way to change that. Again, we have coverage, but what's our effectiveness for how well this actually works? And so we look at this. We're going to just take A equals, and we're going to copy the, the, the second half of the string there. And we're just going to say invoke expression equals A, and we're going to go ahead and run this again. And we completely get around AMSI and its detection. So again, our, our coverage is there, but our effectiveness is extremely low when it comes to how we detect. And that's one of the main problems we run into. Now, the problem I'm talking about here is that most organizations are still at the basics. And that's where we start getting to the problems and discussions around offensive security tooling or new techniques that are being released or new exploits that are being released. Like the Citrus Next, Netscaler is a great example. We should have already had that patch by the time the advisory came out and, and, and the criticality of that came out. Our organization that we work with should say, okay, well, this is a critical risk. We're going to take this into our risk management process and prioritize this. And we're either A, going to take an outage or B, decide, hey, we're going to accept this risk until it comes out this weekend. And, and so that's a normal risk management process within our companies, but not every organization is there. Not every organization is at a maturity level that handles and understands risk or technology risks, especially small to medium-sized businesses that have no idea you know, when it comes to those specific areas. They don't keep an eye on CVEs. They don't understand what are things that are happening out there. So there's a major problem with maturity levels of organizations as, as, as the world grows and, and, and organizations that are more mature that can handle these specific areas. So a lot of organizations are still at the basics and they have a substantial over-reliance on tools. The tools are, are the tools and technology that they purchase. They expect that to be able to handle and fix all of the magical issues that happen when new techniques or new attacks or new tools come out in every shape or form. It's just, just not the case. There's a lot more that goes into it. And so we see organizations getting compromised by legitimate security researcher tools. You know, just recently, Cisco released, you know, fileless, uh, fileless threats consistent with memory code run to memory after initial infection. Cisco flag threats like Copter, Parallax, uh, Divergent, Lemon Duck, and, and they look and they they say examples of circulation include PowerShell Empire, Cobalt Strike, PowerSploit, and Metasploit. Those are all open source researcher tools, tools that are being actively used by adversaries in order to accomplish a specific task. And so there's there's a debate now on whether or not we should be releasing those tools. Should we release PowerShell Empire, tools like PowerShell Empire, tools like Cobalt Strike, uh, tools like PowerSploit and Metasploit? All of these different areas of research that the industry is doing with the intent that it would be used by good folks, but obviously being used by bad folks. We'll get into that. And so let's talk a little bit about the debate on OSTs. Offensive security tools, when it, when it comes to how we release them, I've, I've released a number of them. Um, the Social Engineer Toolkit, Magic Unicorn, you know, uh, the pen testers framework, a number of other tools as well. Um, I released uh, the, the, the Citrix one uh, for, for scanning and exploiting, again, after it had been patched. So there's, 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 there's a debate on, on whether or not offensive security tooling makes the industry better or worse. Now, when you look at, at what we're trying to, to protect against, you know, we're never going to be 100% successful in protecting all organizations, businesses that don't focus on doing technology and security at the same time. Uh, we need to make technology easier and more secure, but at the same time, we're not at that point yet from a, a, a nation perspective or a world perspective to be able to handle the technology changes that we have and the security implications because we still have people using weak passwords. We have people not using multi-factor authentication. We have people clicking on the most horrible fishes that we possibly can imagine. We have people going to horrible websites. You know, there are things that that organizations have problems with that are just at the fundamental, basic, low bar problems out there. And it's not to say that that you know offensive security tooling isn't substantially more advanced in those specific organizations. But one thing that we're trying to look at is, listen, there are a lot of adversaries out there. There are organized crime groups. Um, there are people making millions and millions of dollars off of ransomware. There are nation states. We have a number of different threat models um, as an industry that we have to focus on that we have to protect ourselves against. And they are absolutely using their own tooling, but they're also using open source tooling. They're absolutely using you know, research that, that um, security researchers do. But we do make a difference when it comes to actually fixing things. So you look at the most recent one, and I, I'm going to skip ahead of, on my slides here just a second. 
tooling uh, and technique release really does reduce the attack surface. This most recent one that came out, I can't remember the individual that recently released it. I apologize for, for not remembering the name, but uh, found that with Windows Defender, you know, you could run uh, MP command run.exe, which is the uh, Windows Defender command line syntax for, for Windows Defender. And you could use that to download malware onto the system itself. So you could use Windows Defender to download a specific file. In this case, we just modified our, our attack from before around scripted objects. And we were able to, to then get the same type of attack by using Windows Defender as a mechanism to download our malware in the first place. What was interesting about this is Microsoft, within I think it was a week or two weeks, completely removed this functionality and disabled it because of the disclosure itself. So we reduced the attack surface on a system that an adversary could potentially be using uh, in many cases to, to go through that. And so the debate back on, on the OST side is, you know, if we, if we don't have offensive security tooling and we don't have tools, let's go back to my slide previously be here in the, in, previously here in the past, PowerShell Empire, Cobalt Strike, PowerShell, Metasploit, et cetera, if we don't have those tools, can we effectively test from, a, from a, a red teaming, a penetration testing perspective, from a red versus blue, from a purple team approach, from a blue team perspective of what's actually out there, can we test our programs to understand if we have coverage and effectiveness? Ask yourself, do you understand effectiveness of a specific tool without being able to use that tool? Do you understand your threat models? Uh, Emotet, for example. Do you understand Emotet without being able to understand your effectiveness of being able to combat that? Or do you just rely off of these signatures of Emotet that come out every single week? Or you just rely off of these specific advisories that come out because you're looking at the command and control from DNS. If you're looking for signature-driven detections, this is the wrong industry for that. We can't rely off of signatures to be our saving grace. It's the same problem we ran into in the 90s with signature-based AV. It's the same problem we run into today with EDRs. Signatures are not going to save us from specific types of attacks. We might have coverage, again, that binary one and zero, but it's not going to affect the effectiveness of a specific attack as it changes or morphs. So if we don't have these tools, we don't have the ability to use these tools against us, we don't have the research to make the industry better, we are not going to get better as an industry. Again, you don't want us going into the shadows. And, and that's the crux of this, this specific debate is if you take those away and we go back to, listen, you know, Trusted Sec, we have you know, several folks dedicated to just R&D and weaponization. And, and we have stuff out there that we haven't published because it's kind of our secret sauce. We have undocumented ways of getting remote code execution on the systems that completely goes undetected because we have to show our high-end customers more of that adversary threat. You don't want a lot of us doing that and having those weaponization and toolings because it doesn't make anybody else any better. Now, it simulates what an adversary can do, and then from there they want to see the other post-exploitation scenarios, but it doesn't help anybody else get better when it comes to an industry. It doesn't help Microsoft resolve their issues in, 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 from an attack surface perspective. It doesn't help Apple reduce their attack surface. When we close off these techniques and we hide them, it makes it so much more difficult for us to be able to respond to them and to respond to the types of attacks that we see our adversaries doing. So understanding capabilities of attackers, our threat models. And if you're not familiar with threat modeling, it's literally understanding who your adversaries are towards your company, measuring their capabilities, their, their techniques. You hear the term tac tactics, techniques, and procedures all the time, or TTPs. All of those things come into play when it comes to specific adversaries and building out what adversaries want to go after your organization and making sure that you have both coverage and effectiveness against those specific areas to protect against. So having an understanding of that and focusing less on the coverage or focusing more on the effectiveness is where we need to move. And so, you know, hiding tools for research, again, to protect the masses, I understand the nobility of that. Uh, I understand why we want to do that, because, again, there are, there are collateral damages that happen. And this is one of the hardest things. I remember having a, um, a discussion in, in Vegas, it was two years ago, with one of our folks at Trust. It's like, I won't name him to, to embarrass him or anything. But, you know, he had mentioned, hey, I, I released a tool that was, that was used in a nation saying, I really, I really struggle with that because, you know, it could be used, it was being used for malicious purposes. And same thing for things like Magic Unicorn. Magic Unicorn has been used actively um, in specific you know, types of tools. Believe me, attackers would be using different techniques, different tooling, different ways of research going into an organization if that tool hadn't been published. You know how many times I've gotten, listen, thank you for publishing Magic Unicorn because I'm able to test 
the effectiveness of PowerShell in my environment. I was able to get a script block logging and constrained language mode put in my environment because of this. Or you know, I was able to get them to upgrade a PowerShell version six and, and completely disable PowerShell version two in the first place. You know, we are making changes to reduce our attack surfaces to make our technology footprint substantially lower. And again, focusing less on on the actual exploit itself that that is there, and that, that's still important, but focusing on how do we maximize our our defenses when an actual attacker is in our environment? How do we stop ransomware? Well, network segmentation, right? That's only one of 30 other things you can be doing. That's allowing PowerShell to regular users. Hey, do regular users need a full fledged full, full fledged programming uh, language? You know, pro, uh, privilege management. You know, making sure that, that you know I can't go from one system to the next and be able to escalate to a certain area. You know, disabling things like printer spool options in Active Directory. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do to to make ourselves more resilient from an attack surface perspective. But we don't usually look at that from our threat models and say, well, here's all the ways that an attacker can get in and and, and get access to this data. How do we move that backwards and and go backwards to protect ourselves against it? Security through obscurity is not the way. It is not the way. If we, if we don't have people going out there and doing research, we don't have people going out there and, and doing uh, new tool development to, to help people that may not have the ability to be able to develop the tools or time and effort. You know, red teaming is a great example. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that don't have the ability to develop their own C2 infrastructure, malleable C2s, and things that they can use to, to actively um, you know, simulate an adversary in their organization to test their effectiveness. That's why tools like Cobalt Strike with Mudge do an amazing job at that. You know, allowing red teams to go and do it. But yes, it is used by adversaries. And yes, it's used by other attackers and, 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 and people that, that are bad. But we're actively using it to try to protect ourselves. It's, it's, it's a, a very, very interesting debate to kind of go through. Ignoring risk does not equal strategy. When you're talking about organizations that don't do security, it is, it is on them to do security. If they're doing technology, if they're leveraging an iPhone, if they're leveraging Office 365, it is on them to protect themselves. It is not our job or responsibility to do it. Now, it's our job and responsibility to educate them and to get them to hopefully care about security, but ultimately a risk decision around whether or not we want to invest in security is that business's decision. And it might be the right one. You know, if, if they're a small business startup and uh, you know, they're like, no one's gonna touch us, and you know, they might very well may, might be right. They might also get hit by ransomware and shut down their entire business. It's a risk that you take, you know, Vegas odds when it comes to what you're dealing with. But knowing that if you're going to have an online business and you're going to grow that business from a technological perspective, as part of working in the world today, you need to focus on security as part of that. And even the basics make a big difference. Microsoft had a stat last, last year that all, out of all the business email compromises that they, they investigated, 99.8% of them could have been prevented by, by multi-factor authentication, right? So we have a lot of these small things that organizations can do to really substantially focus on increasing their overall security posture. So businesses need to take notice and to focus on security, as a lot of them are, and a lot of them aren't. So adversaries I'm using tooling, and, and Jason is not an adversary. Just, I just wanted to put a happy face in this specific one. But, but adversaries will continue to develop tooling. I mean, you know, you look at China, you look at Russia, you look at Iran, that, that is a very small demographic of adversaries. You know, there's not, there's not a massive subset of, of, of companies that would fall into the nation state category. And everybody likes to talk about them like they're the ones they're trying to protect against. When you look at, at, at the capabilities of where ransomware has gone, ransomware has, has substantially increased their sophistication levels over the past five years set to today. I mean, this is a multi, multi, multi-million dollar operation. There's some really large groups out there making you know, 70, 80, 90 million dollars, that's a lot of money for somebody to, to become rich off of. And they're gonna continue to advance those, those capabilities. They will continue to develop those whether or not there's a tool there or not. The weaponization and tooling around Emotet, for example, initial entry points, things like that morph and change all the time so they're successful. Yes, they might bolt on a secondary tool that may help them with other components, but they would do the same thing anyway. Maybe it wouldn't have a pretty GUI, or it wouldn't have, you know, be, be thoroughly vetted from an overall research perspective, but it would still have the same type of tooling, and we would have nothing to actually go and test our effectiveness against them in any way, shape, or form. So again, ways that we can get better by, by using tooling itself. And this is really a delicate balance. I mean, you know, there are, there are things out there that, that, you know, kind of, you know, tiptoe around that line of, of, hey, should we release this? You know, exploits are a great example of that. We work well with, 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 exploit research because we go through responsible disclosure. 
but there really isn't that same type of thing for for techniques. There really isn't that same type of thing for for tooling because it's a completely different type of subset of, of how we're trying to protect our systems. And I'm not saying we need responsible disclosure for those. You know, if it's a technique that that could potentially impact the system, I think those should be things we disclose. But tooling, research, things that we can use to to get better as an industry. You know, we are not enemies when it comes to blue and red. We are working together and. Anybody that talks about that, by the way, really bothers me because it's such an old, 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 old way of thinking in this industry. And we're talking 15 years old. When I hear, you know, red team is, is, is supposed to be like the, the rock stars and they're going in, burning down things. And they don't care about blue, you know, and, and they're always all about, you know, themselves and, and hacking. That is that is not accurate in, in any retrospect today in this industry. You know, red red's ultimate goal is for blue to get better. And for that continual balance of force so that we keep moving up and up and up and that blue gets better because that, that's ultimately the goal of this is to simulate offensive capabilities, having the tooling to actively go and do it and to have, you know, the blue team get better with their security program as they go along. And, and I'll quote John again. This is the, the real John. This isn't the, uh, the, 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 uh, the first thing you, you search when you look for John Strand that I was not expecting with my kids behind me there earlier. But uh, Blue, you don't want us to go back into the shadows. That is not the right approach for how we're handling security today. You know, having us be more overt and having us actually work with you and testing and releasing the tools and the practices so that you can get better with your defenses. Those are things that we have to do. And it's, it's a continual life cycle. Where companies really fall into it is when they go and they buy a SIM and they buy a piece of technology, they put it in, they say, I'm good. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Our business has changed. Our technology changes. Attackers change. We have to invest in that in our organizations and companies. We have to invest in people and training them so that we can continue to get better with our overall attack surface, reduce that, and understand that it's not just about vulnerability management or all the other programs that we have. It's also about what happens after the fact. So we really need to treat post-exploitation the same way we judge exploitation risk because ultimately, at the end of the day, that's going to be the way that we, we get better as an industry, focusing more on post-exploitation, dwell time, reducing the attack surface for those specific types of attacks and lateral movement in our environment. You shut down lateral movement, you shut down a large component around how an attacker gets access to your data. Um, that's ultimately how we're going to run through all this. But really, I want to close with, with, you know, I understand it's a heated debate. I understand that everybody has a lot of opinions on this. And I understand that, that, that what I explained is not perfect. What I'm trying to get to is that you know, we talk, you know, a lot of these, these folks out there that are arguing the offensive security tooling, when you look at, at, at how they're, they're looking at detection, it's, it's very much on a coverage perspective. It's whether or not we have coverage over this specific attack, a one or a zero. They're not looking at the effectiveness of that detection. They're not looking at the effectiveness of being able to have coverage around a multiple set of, 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 of techniques and how the behavior of those work, it's more so focused on whether or not we can detect that specific type of instance. And that is, that is I'm not going to say that's the wrong approach. It's, it's a unique approach. It's a, it's a different approach than I would take than this. I would rather know what I could do. To, I'd rather build a tool or, or use a tool. I'd rather understand what that tool does. I'd want to understand how that actual technique works. Uh, I wouldn't focus on Cobalt Strike as an example. I'd focus on C2. How does C2 work in our environment? How do they get code execution in my system? And how do I block C2 or detect C2 in my environment? I'm not going to build something off of Cobalt Strike specific. Now, maybe I will based on prevalence, prevalence of it, but, but I'm not necessarily going to be focusing on that as a, as a main issue. Reg SVR32, great example. Baseline in my environment, look for deviations. PowerShell, great example. Look for those, those uh, um, commands and then look for deviations. PowerShell is a great one. You know, hey, PowerShell you know, uh, uh, being executed and beaking out to the internet. Let's baseline our environments, build exceptions for those, look for deviations of those. How do we reduce that even further? Hey, minimizing, you know, uh, uh, users that can actually execute PowerShell in the first place and only allowing people that actually need access to a full-fledged programming language to be able to access it. Things that we can do to make our attack surface much smaller for the attackers, but also relying on the tools themselves to actually go and help us. So, you know, thank you all very much. You know, I uh, really appreciate you listening to me talk. And, and again, thanks again to, to John and team, over, everybody at Wild West Hack and Fest. I wish I was there in person, uh, hanging out and talking to you all in person with this specific one. Uh, but thank you all for having me. And uh, I know the rest of the conference is going to go absolutely amazing. Can't wait to catch all the talks. And uh, I'll hop in the uh, the Discord channel here in just a few minutes to, to talk to everybody.
I want to thank you and I'll pass it back over. And Dave, thank you so much for coming. And you know, this whole open source tool debate, you and I have talked about this at length about how hard it is to do this debate because we have very, very good friends on the other side of this debate. And you know, when you're talking about people like Florian, you're talking about people like Richard Bates, like these people are my heroes. I'd like to still consider these people to be my friends, but it's hard because I boil it down to one simple thing. If you look at a lot of people that are worried about us releasing tooling and the attackers using those tools and we're releasing them on GitHub with step-by-step -step instructions and full source code. And for a lot of the people, they look at this as one of the most grievous issues in computer security today. And if the biggest issue is tools being released with full source code on freaking GitHub, this industry is screwed. So it's one of those one of those debates that I think we're going to be fighting for a long time. And then the other thing I'd like to get your opinion on before Doc comes out, I I personally believe that the offensive community for a long term long time we were a bunch of assholes. Yeah. We were not not all of us, but there was a lot of us that really weren't that cool. I know that there's times that I'm sure in presentations offensive, you know, years ago. I was not nice to the blue team. I think that we've all worked hard over years to get better and kind of self-police ourselves with that. But I'd like to get your opinion on that. I, I will concede that we could have done better years ago, but I hate it whenever we're still painted with the same brush of the offensive community from 15 years ago. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think I think the mentality was very different back then, right, John? I mean, you know, I think the the mentality was we're going to push this out. It's going to be badass, and we're going to be looked at as badasses. And you know, and who cares what the ramifications are because this is badass. And 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 mm -hmm. it wasn't. I, I think it was it was definitely. Um, you know, people talk about the the rock star mentality, right? And 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 that was kind of. And I and I hate that term. I hate that term more than than anybody. I hate when somebody's like, "Oh, this guy's a rock star." I'm like, "No, no, 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 I'm not. I'm a computer nerd. No one ever recognizes me as being the computer nerd on Fox or CNN." You know, um, you know, it, we, we changed substantially to we're publishing this out because of our street credibility. To we're focusing on this to make you better, and and that's the maturity mm -hmm. I think that's happened in this industry is that. You know, we are we are all working together to figure out a way to to make our organizations better, our people better, technology better, and 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 we're we're open to hearing other ways of doing things. Like you know, everybody's open to hearing, hey, this is a new way of doing something different. But you know, when it comes to to offensive security tooling, it, when you look at what people are releasing, it's not. You know, I don't look at people doing it for street credibility. I look at it at they're doing it because they're passionate about it. They're learning things. They're figuring things out. They're sharing their research and they're trying to make things better. They're 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 passionate about making things better. And that's the difference. It's not about ego or or you know making anybody else look bad. It's about trying to make people better. I think that's that's a major shift in our industry. And I honestly believe that Ron Bose. I think had the best quote ever whenever he released. I can't remember if it was DNS Cat 1 or DNS Cat 2. I love Ron. Uh, somebody in the audience was very angry about that. And they were like, why are you releasing a tool like this? This is so dangerous. What is your reason for doing this? And you know Ron is one of the coolest, gentlest people in this industry. He said, I'm releasing DNS Cat 2 or DNS Cat. I can't remember which iteration. So that in the future, tools like DNS Cat will never work again. And yeah. that is ultimately what a lot of us in this industry have been doing for, for a very long time. And I know we're out of time, but I, I want to, 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 to do a devil's advocate of that one, which is when CDC released Back Orifice. I don't know if anybody's ever actually watched that video of when they released Back Orifice. If you get a chance, go look at that video. It's, it's, it's an incredible time. They're on, on stage, you know, jamming on guitars and just having a party. And there's all these people talking about it. And, you know, you know what, um, you know, the difference, John, of what you just said now today versus what it was 15 or 20 years ago. When somebody asked that question in the audience on, on hey, whether or not, you know, what are, what are we supposed to do now that you just released this? We're all totally screwed. And you know what the answer was back? And, I'm, you know, again, different time was, mm -hmm. you know, take off your shirt and show us your, 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 your chest. And, and it was a guy, you know, that was and a guy and a guy. You know, it was, it was basically you're screwed. We don't care. We're releasing this because we're the coolest ones out there. And, and it was a different mentality back then versus what it is today. We've learned a lot from that substantially. And, 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 and I like that to those two comparisons where Ron was doing it to 
make sure that it, it couldn't be used before uh, used in the future, that we had access to it, that we could actually fix it. Whereas before it was like, hey, we're the coolest ones up here. We're up here jamming in guitars and this is the new industry. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate it. And next time, DeLorean. Sounds good. I'll do it all from DeLorean. Thank you all so much and appreciate you listening to me talking. John, I love you, man. Love you. Love you, Joff. Love you, everybody at BHS and uh, Wild West. Thank you so much.